First, I want to thank everyone today for joining us here at SeaWorld Orlando. Uh, my name is Megan McCullough. I'm one of our Senior One animal trainers here. Uh, I've been at SeaWorld for the past 10 years. I came, I started in 2010 uh, with our education department, and I worked with our animal ambassador team over there, where we took care of uh, freshwater and saltwater aquariums, our reptiles for our interaction program, and probably one of my favorite animals to ever work with, our Magellanic penguins. Uh, after doing that for a couple of years, I moved over into our animal train apartment with our animal ambassador team. So we worked with kind of similar as before with guests and interaction and talking about conservation uh, with our animals, typically birds and small mammals. And I went to Sea Lion Otter Stadium and then finally I got moved over here to our killer whale stadium. Now here at our killer whale stadium, we've actually had the opportunity to not only work with killer whales, but also short fin pilot whales and our birds of prey. So we've had a lot of experience of working with a variety of different animals um, throughout my time here at SeaWorld. But before SeaWorld, I actually have been in the animal or the behavioral service industry for 20 years. I started when I was 13 uh, working with athletes. And that kind of gave me a foundation of understanding behavior. And when we change things in the environment, we get a different behavioral outcome. Um, from doing that and going into my undergraduate degree at Fairleigh Dickinson, I studied marine biology and then I had a small concentration in animal behavioral research where we looked at different studies like from gastropod mucus tracking to canine disposition um, compared to their learning curve and retention rates. And then coming to SeaWorld and then finally I just recently graduated from Purdue Global University in psychology uh, with my uh, concentration in applied behavior analysis. So the presentation that we're talking about today is applied behavior analysis with animals. And the reason why it's so cool is that we've kind of been starting this program um, in 2019 in September, we went to AZA and Amada and we presented on how SeaWorld is kind of using this science um, that is used with humans all the time to be able to help take care of and interact with our killer whales specifically here at SeaWorld. Uh, we've also done this presentation with Eckerd College, it's their animal studies program, Purdue Global University, Bush Gardens, um, and we're going to be presenting at an international behavior analyst uh, convention that's called ABAI in just a couple of weeks. So we're really excited to be able to share this with all of you and kind of more of the science side of how we take care of our animals. So to start with that, I know that we have a wide variety of people here, um, but we're really going to be focusing in on what is, when we say an applied behavior analysis, what is that? What does it mean? And so to talk about that, we kind of have to peel back all the layers and go to the history of behavior analysis. So basically what happened, it's a really cool scientist named B.F. Skinner started looking at behavior in a laboratory. And he did it with rats and pigeons. And what he did, he was able to uncover that if you do certain things, behavior will either increase or it's going to decrease. And so by doing that in a laboratory or a controlled setting, then there were people that said, well, if that works with a rat and a pigeon, could it work with a human? And so around the 1960s, you had different hostels that were trying to take the science and apply it to humans in everyday environments. And so what we're showing is just like how the science works with um, individuals that might have developmental dis delays, um, behavioral disorders, or even something probably the most common is known as autism spectrum disorder or ASD. This same technology also works with animals. And this is how we've been interacting with our animals for the past 50 years. And so we're excited to kind of talk about that scientific space with it. So when we first start off and we're looking at ABA and what an applied behavior analyst is gonna do with their client, how does it interact with humans? right the first thing that those those practitioners are going to have to do is that they're going to have to make observations right they're going to have to sit and they're going to either watch a student in a classroom maybe they're going to watch how a teacher interacts well guess what that's exactly what we do here so we have um two of our trainers on the far side you have kelly and morgan they're going to be interacting with our male killer whales we're going to be able to see them in a little bit it's Makayo and trua and this kind of discussion that they're having right now, this is what we do. So our observations start from the moment we come through our back gate or anytime we come out of the kitchen, the fish house kitchen, uh, before we even step up to an animal, we're already watching them and observing them just the same way that a teacher is gonna do with their children or a parent's gonna do with a child or even you might do with your friends. Once we start stepping up, we're able to have that discussion. Now I think that this is probably one of the most critical parts of our care and the welfare for the animals and the reason being is that when you typically talk to a trainer and you ask them 
maybe a newer trainer more specifically, but you ask them, when does the session start? A lot of people always say, well, it starts when you step up and you start interacting them. When the reality is that you should be starting well before that to kind of know what's going on in that animal's environment. What are they experiencing? Uh, no differently than you would with your own family members and friends and kids in a school setting. Now, once you've made those observations, we can start up and we're going to start walking this way and talking so we can get a little bit closer to um, Trua and Mikayo. But we have to build a rapport with them. Now, this is no different than how you interact with humans, right? So to interact with humans and to build those relationships, whether you're looking at a teacher-student relationship, whether you're looking at a family dynamic, maybe just friends, coworkers, you're going to start interacting and learning what that person likes. Now, in ABA, what we say is you want to pair with them. So you want to pair yourself with something that's so reinforcing that you're going to intrinsically become reinforcing as well. So for us, when we start developing these type of relationships, it takes a long time to be able to do what Kelly and Morgan are doing right now. But when we have trainers that are starting to learn new animals, what we'll do is we'll pair them with someone, let's say that Morgan, working with Trua, right, interacting with Trua right now. Now, Morgan's been with Trua for several years, so she knows all of Trua's likes, the ins and outs of how he is as just a whale, because they're all different, just like you and me. So a newer trainer is just going to sit and watch Morgan, and they're going to ask a lot of questions. Morgan's going to ask them, are you paying attention? Are you seeing what he's doing right now? Are you watching his behavior? And by being able to do that, that person is paired with Morgan and Trua starts to associate the two of them as something very good, something very reinforcing. Now, over time, you can develop a relationship like this where Mikhail's here just hanging out with Kelly. Kelly's just giving him a big old food rub. Um, and so what this does right here is this is one of our favorite ways to just be able to interact with the whales. We're gonna get a little bit closer. We're gonna go ahead and step right on in here. I think that one of our favorite things when we're developing a relationship with the whale is finding out what they like. Because just like you and me, they are all so different. Um, Truly, you can see, he really enjoys just hanging out, being rubbed on his underside of his belly, his pectoral flippers. This is probably one of the most important part of being a trainer or working with animals, being a keeper, is getting to know your animal so well. Just like being a parent, getting to know your child. You have to know what your child's behavior is doing, and that's no different than how we interact with our killer whales. Now, once we kind of have an idea and we've developed this relationship, that it starts with a rapport and develops to a relationship. And what I mean by that is, remember how I said it takes a lot of time to develop that? Well, the reason why is because you have to have a lot of different experiences that are really reinforcing. So there are going to be times that you're going to learn more about Mikhail be just from all the different interactions that you go through with him, right? And guess what? It's equally important that Mikhail learns about Kelly because we're all different as trainers. We all have things that we really like to do, and the whales pick up on that as well. So it's a really cool thing. It's very important to provide optimum welfare for our animals. Now, another thing that we want to talk about for sure is what are the motivating operations? So in, in ABA, in our behavior analysis, we typically talk about these MOs. And those motivating operations, they change. Now, there's a lot of things that are intri intrinsically motivating operations, like food, water, sleep, activity, things like that. Those are things that you don't have to be conditioned to know those for all of us, even as humans. Those are things that are really enjoyable. So one of the things that we learn with them is what are the things that they really like? Activity is a big one. Uh, this is one of the play sessions. Trua, he is, Mikhail does this as well, but Trua really enjoys tossing it back. So it's almost like playing a game of fetch and catch. Um, and the boys have shown us that they have fights up when they're playing different types of games like this. But the fact of the matter is that all of these act in different ways, and we have different what we call functions of behavior. So some of those functions, just so you guys can see the kind of correlation between whether it's killer whales or if you're talking about with us as humans, we look at different things of why behavior occurs. So that could be for attention. It could be to receive some type of tangibles. It could be sensory. 
think about one time that you wanted to have your back scratched, right? You might have asked a friend or a parent, hey, can you go ahead and rub my back? Or what about if you saw an animal at a zoo, maybe a giraffe stretching out and rubbing its neck on some type of like tree or something? That might have been a sensory need that he needs to scratch its neck a little bit, right? So it's the same thing with the animals. Now there are other things that we're gonna look at as well that you might see that it might just be for that one that I talked about as attention. Now attention is probably one of the biggest things that we're gonna look at here. And it actually segues us into the main part of what we want to talk about, and that is our research study. So we recently did a really cool study with our killer whales, and we wanted to see if we could apply the same techniques that are used with humans, with ABA, with our killer whales, and also with our training staff. So what we saw is that with applied behavior analysis, you have to identify behaviors of social significance. Now, what does that even mean, right? What is social significant to me might not be socially significant to you. There's a large continuum that kind of these type of behaviors land on. And we we're talking about animals, especially in zoological care or under human care. Basically, all of the behaviors are socially significant to some level. And also the behaviors of our trainer staff to interact with them because it all helps to build up that animal's positive animal welfare technique, right? So, what we wanted to say is we wanted to see if our trainers could be trained using some, something called behavior skills training. Now, this is a little bit different than maybe if you were at school and you were learning how to do some math problems, right? It'd be a little bit different than that because what we look for with behavioral skills training is that they're going to go ahead and we have a certain criteria that the animals, that the trainers have to meet. So they have a skill, they learn that skill, and they have to be able to maintain that skill set at this certain level. Now, once they've learned that skill set and they've shown us they understand it, now we're gonna ask them to step back up with the animals and see if they can show us. So we use something called discrete trial training with the whales. And the behavior that we were looking for was specifically attention. And the reason why is because we saw that there were times that maybe the, hit, the whales during our interactions would drop their head. But it wasn't consistent among all the whales. It wasn't consistent with all the trainers. So we wanted to ask the question, why? And when we asked this question, we did something called a functional analysis, which just means it's a big word to say that we're gonna put this in different situations and see, are they wanting to interact with us? Or maybe are they not wanting to interact with us? And guess what? The results showed that it was unanimous, that it was an attention-seeking behavior that was positively reinforced by our trainers. So we said, you know what, with understanding that, let's put that back into the behavioral plan. So we retrained our trainers. We said, these are gonna be what we call our A, B, Cs. This is what you're gonna do before the behavior. This is the behavior we're looking for. And this is gonna be the consequence, what we're giving the animal to show them that that behavior is exactly it. And guess what? We didn't use any food to train this. We only used 30 seconds of trainer attention. And so what we want to show you, something that we haven't shown yet, we talked about it, but you guys are going to be able to see firsthand the training principles that we use here. You guys ready? Yes. Awesome. Right. All right, so when we step in, what they're going to do, we wanted to embed this, these trials, this free trial training, into a team contingent session because that's when we were seeing the behavior. So when we talk about attention, real quick, I'm going to show them what we're looking for. Attention topography meant that their rostrum was above the water level, so the tip of their, their body, and their eye patches were pointed in the direction of the trainer. But they also had to respond to the trainer's signal within two seconds, all right? So let's see, let's see if we can do this, girls. So this is the first one. So right now, we're looking at two different behaviors, yeah? We want to tell them good job because we're embedding this, like I said, into team contingent. So this is one of the things that's really important is our killer whales to work really well together, right? That social unit. We're going to do a lineup. Now, Kelly wouldn't know what behavior I'm going to ask for. And this is where we start the trial. Good job. That's awesome. So you saw Mikhail was there. He was paying attention. He had that attentive photography. Now, she went ahead, she waited nicely to make sure that he was definitely paying attention to her. Once he, she knew he was paying attention to her, 
he asked for the SD or that signal. So it's going to ask him to lay up like this. This is a way that we can relate with him. We can do body exams with him. This is a great husband behavior or healthcare behavior. And now the consequence for that, that positive reinforcement, is that she is going to interact with him for 30 seconds. All right. And you can see that Morgan's just going to be interacting with Trua, giving him all the love, all the attention that she wants. You're paying attention again, and you're ready for your next trial. So both the trainers come back over again. You can see they both have that great attentive photography. Kelly, this time we're going to just walk. So the person that was, the trainer that was interacting with the whale didn't know what the next behavior was going to be until this last scene. And now here starts your trial. So she's waiting to make sure that he's paying attention with her, to her. He's not playing with his food. Clearly watching. Great job. And now he gets to have that 30 seconds again. So this was literally all we were looking at. Is how can we, if we know that this is attention based, how can we go ahead and take what they're wanting, what's the function of their behavior, and use it back in the behavioral programming? Now we had trainers that did a lot of different things from playing with the lids, you can see he's just jamming it up with her. Um, we even had a trainer that just sat there and kind of danced back and forth to Mikhail, and then Mikhail did not break his attention the entire time. One of the interesting things for all my behavior analysts out there uh, that we added here is we added high uh, probability request sequencing. So if something were to happen, let's say that maybe Mikhail didn't get it that time. Instead, what we did we kind of gave a small little pause, let him know. That wasn't exactly what we were looking for. And then we asked for all high probability behaviors. So very similar to um, what you saw Morgan and Kelly asking them to do together. And then after they did those behaviors, um, those three behaviors, it built up what we call behavioral momentum. And by doing that, we saw that the fourth year, how quickly the killer whale was responding to the same SD that maybe, or that same signal that they didn't get the first time, that now they got it very, very quickly. And so that was something that our trainers remarked on that we're looking to implement a little bit more solidly within our programming of saying, hey, let's go ahead and build up that success, all of that positivity, and then let's re-ask the same question and see if we can get the right answer at that time. You know, so you guys can see how our trainers are interacting with our animals. Um, it's just a lot of fun, a lot of hard work, but it's so rewarding to be able to get to know these animals like how we are here. Now, this is not the only way that we're, we're looking at using applied behavior analysis and how it impacts our animal welfare. And it really helps us to be able to really solve the science of behavior to make sure that they have the top quality of life with us. We're also looking at this with our, how we train our staff. So we've actually started our own other study that's looking at our birds of prey. And what we're doing is the same behavior skills training that we use here with our killer whales. Now, instead, we're taking it with our birds of prey. And I think that I have a bird of prey over here for you guys. So I'm gonna go ahead and start making my way that way. All right. So this is Alfred. Now, Alfred was actually, he was brought to us uh, by the Audubon Society. Um, he had imprinted on some humans, and so he wasn't going to be fit, a fit candidate to be released back out into the wild. And so Audubon actually asked us if we would be okay taking him on and using him as an ambassador to be able to help educate and teach other people. Now, the great thing here is that Mimi, she had zero bird of prey experience, right? And so how do you train someone who has killer whale experience, but she's never worked with bird of prey? They're going to be working. We're going to interact with them slightly differently than how we do with our killer whales. You see, we don't use any food with their training. They get their food every single day at the end of, Alfred specifically, at the end of the night, right? So we have to build that relationship, that rapport. So the same thing that we were talking about here with Morgan and Kelly and developing that relationship, those times and those experiences that are so reinforcing between both Kelly and the whale or Morgan and the whale, it's the same thing that we're going to have happen here with Mimi and Alfred. 
we spend a lot of time just going down and sitting with them to develop that. And then we have a senior trainer that has a lot of bird experience to go through the same behavioral skills training that we did um, with those animals with them. So we broke down the different parts of what we need to do from everything from how do you pick up an owl? How can we kennel the owl? Because that kenneling behavior is important for their husbandry to be able to take them down to a vet. How do we take out owl's weight? How do we put them onto a scale? You know, and then how do we take them out in the park and we walk them around, we use them for educational purposes. Those are all things that we can build off of because of that rapport building that we developed with our animals. Thanks, Mia, for sharing, being able to bring him over here. So that's a little bit about why, why the killer whales are so important, why the behavior, behavior is so important with everything that we do, um, and why more importantly, applied behavior analysis is an integral part of how we care and provide welfare for not just our killer whales, but for all of our animals here at SeaWorld. Using that positive reinforcement training, making things very, um, very positive, very reinforcing, and having animals that have a strong connection, a strong relationship and rapport with the animals is critical for their welfare. We hope that you guys have enjoyed this. I'm looking forward to being able to answer your, your questions. Yeah, so can you hear me? Yes. All right, so we have a number of questions. Uh, we have uh, people visiting from all over the world, and that was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And when we're all done at the very end, I'll unmute everyone so we can give an applause. Um, but I, John Scott had a very interesting question. John, you are unmuted. Do you want to ask your question? Sure. Hi, Megan, and hi, everybody listening. Megan, I had a question for you. You kind of talked a little bit about it um, with your great horned owl, but I was just wondering if you could talk about the possibility of replicate, replicating your study at like different zoos and aquariums across the country. And like, is what you learned, is that applicable to all species that are in human care? John, first off, thank you. It's so good to hear your voice. Um, so yes, that's, that is, I think, you hit a couple of different points that I don't want to go off on a tangent with, um, but one of the reasons why I felt like this was so important for us to talk about in the zoo world is because if you think about how we developed our behavioral under understanding of positive reinforcement, working on that operant conditioning of telling the animals when they're good with using um, the, all the things that they like, there has been a slight miss that we kind of missed out on the science side of it and keeping that kind of science practitioner mindset with it. Um, a lot of it's done through our zoos as we know how to use positive reinforcement very well, right? I would say across the board, our, our industry is great with that. But one of the things that we could get better with and even help out the science of ABA is learning how to generalize already established uh, interventions and using the correct terminology for them. Right, so I know that we call it ABC, but here we're going to talk about in our area about discrete trial training when we're putting it into that kind of a context. And I do think, just like we saw from these, these, uh, this technology or the behavioral programming was used in a controlled setting, and then it was generalized to humans in an applied or everyday setting. And then guess what? It's going to be regeneralized. That's what we're doing right now to animals in an everyday setting. So. Regardless if you're looking at here at SeaWorld, any of our other zoos, aquariums across the world, if you're looking at your own, if you have a farm, your animals, your domestic animals, the science of behavior is always about the subject and the subject is behavior. It's not a specific species. So I think that that's something that we would love to do eventually is to continue to expand this and to generalize it across a variety of different environments and, and species. It's a great question, John. We have a, a really interesting question from Jonathan. Jonathan, you are unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Megan. Uh, so coming from another seasonal trainer here, I was just curious, social interaction, play, enrichment, and physical contact are obviously huge secondary reinforcers. Do you guys see any other ones with the orcas? Yeah, so I love what you just said there, Jonathan. You call it a secondary reinforcer, which I think that for our industry, we really focus on secondary and primary reinforcers, right? And primary for anyone that's listening in, you're talking about what the animal needs, and it's typically related to food base is what we refer it to. And secondary is basically anything that might be conditioned or learned and paired with something that's a primary, like food, that they learn that it's very reinforcing. 
One of the things that I love about ABA is that yes, you can talk about primary and secondary, but you talk more specifically about the function of the reinforcing, right? So let's say for example, that you're working on a behavior with a child and maybe the behavior is a function of the child's not wanting to sit and do their schoolwork. So they get up every two minutes. So you're trying to increase their attention on their work. You might reinforce them with giving them allowing them to get away or escape from doing their work, right? So if you focus on what the actual function of the reinforcer is and apply that into your behavioral programming, then you're actually reinforcing the subject, whether it's human or animal, with what they're actually wanting. So I think that that's something that we can learn from and grow with uh, within our industry and try to focus on why are they doing that and let's tie that back in as a reinforcer. So to answer your question specifically though about what other types of secondaries we might use, um, one of the ones that you might see, uh, especially with our killer whales, we have ones that, uh, we have a massive fire hose and it's like a big old back massage really for the killer whales. Uh, the boys really enjoy having to swim up in that, feeling that on their peduncle. Um, the girls, Malia will put her pectoral flipper up and kind of just move it back and forth as that, uh, as the fire hose is kind of just pushing water onto them. Um, so that's something that they really do enjoy. We also use finger painting. So when we've been open in the past for some of our tours that we'll do, uh, we'll actually bring the paint, the finger paint down to the glass and allow the guests to kind of have this interactive play with the killer whales. That's very enriching for the whales, but it's also really cool for the guests because they're getting to interact with the killer whale in a way that's not normal, right? That's not a typical way that you're going to be able to see a uh, killer whale or interact with them, but it's very stimulating for our animals. And Malia specifically, Trua and Makayo seem to really jive with that. They really enjoy it. Great question. That is a wonderful question. We have a question from Jordan. Uh, Jordan, you are unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, my question was, if you don't use any food reinforcement with the birds of prey, is it mostly trainer um, interaction and that type of thing that you use for reinforcement with them? Yeah, so what we do, and we've done this with other animals as well. So for example, like the Magellanic penguins that I talked about before, um, we had some PR otters that they were, done, they were trained the same way. So basically they're conditioned that their food is not associated with us in the training process. It's basically, this is your meal, this is your meal. And then we do all this other stuff that's really cool and stimulating with them. Um, it's based off of relationship. I can't reinforce that enough, especially with the Magellanic penguins. Um, birds specifically, they pick on someone and they really like them. And sometimes you can change that and sometimes you can't. So we basically look at how can we pair with them so for example, with the bird study now, one of our senior one trainers, her name's Amy, she's absolutely fantastic with birds of prey. And she has a really good relationship with one of our bald eagles named Maddie. Well, so I'm learning about Maddie and learning how to interact with her. I spent a lot of time just hanging out with Amy and I, with Maddie, just even sitting in the same area with Maddie and just talking to her. So she can just see me interacting with Amy. She can get used to my voice. She can get used to how I walk, how I move around that's all really important. So it's all really based off of that rapport, that relationship that we've built with them that allows us to do the things that we're able to do. Great question. Uh, we have a question from Jenny. Jenny, you are unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, um, I noticed a lot of zoos have noticed changes in their animals' behavior since there are no guests currently. Some of those changes have been positive, some negative. Have you noticed anything with the whales or the other animals in your care? You know, that's a great question. I think that for us, what's going on with our whales is they are getting the same amount of interaction. They have great stimulation. Um, I would say that their welfare just in general through the roof, regardless of in this situation or outside of the COVID situation that we're in has just been phenomenal. Um, so we've got to be a little bit more creative with kind of how we're interacting, different ways that we're interacting, which is a lot of fun. And that variability, you see it with, with the animals, but that's part of what we do as uh, serial trainers, right? We want to always add variability and find ways that, hey, maybe you've gotten into a pattern for the past couple of days. How do we break that pattern for ourselves? You know, because we're that front line for their welfare. And so I think that that's something that this has given us an opportunity to expand and say, oh, well, we could do this or we could do that. But that being able to figure that out is very important. That's kind of what we do every single day, regardless if we're open or closed. 
So I would say that they're, what they're doing is pretty standard from what we were doing before. Great question. We have a question from France. Uh, Tituan, um, you are unmuted, my friend. Go ahead and ask your question. Hello. I would, uh, I would know uh, how did you, did you want it to, did you have the idea to study applied behavior analysis in killer whales? That's great. It's a great question. Um, to kind of answer it, we have to back up a little bit. So when we talked in the beginning, a lot of my training um, before going to, um, I'd say halfway through my career here at SeaWorld was really, um, it was on my own. It was hands-on. It was learning from trial and error. And when I came to SeaWorld, I knew that I wanted to be a trainer. Um, and I went to a conference called the International Marine Animal Trainers Association or AMADA in um, Las Vegas. And Dr. Susan Friedman was speaking at that event. She was our keynote speaker. I just got goosebumps thinking about this. She, what she said was absolutely amazing. And I don't know if it was because of the fact that I had worked previously with kids that I connected with what she was saying. It made sense to me. And she talked about ABA and she was providing these classes for zookeepers. So I took those classes. And from that point on, honestly, I knew I was stuck that this was the path I was supposed to go in. And why specifically with killer whales, I would, I would change it to just animals in general for sure. Um, the passion for that came up through my graduate courses. So when I was talking to some of the professors, some of them agreed and understood that this is applied behavior analysis. It's just with a different species. Um, and some of them did it. And I think that that's one of the things that I became very passionate about is how do we explain that the positive reinforcement training and maybe we expand what we're doing to incorporate more of those established, uh, established treatments that have already been uh, validated with human work with our animals and the way that we train our staff. And so that with uh, talking about talking through that and then doing my thesis here, it was kind of that was a direction that I just knew that I really wanted to go in and continue to go in because I think it's so important to talk about what zoos and aquariums are doing and how we manage the animals to give them the optimal welfare. And to do that, we have to keep that scientific practitioner mindset um, of holding true to the science of ABA. Great question. That was a great question. Uh, we have a question from uh, Julie. Julie, you are unmuted. You had a wonderful question. Go ahead and ask it. All right. Um, I, I know that Megan has some background with um, aquatic non-mammals. Um, there are a few species, sharks, fish, etc., that don't really exhibit affinity for human interaction, or at least um, don't really seem to actively seek it out. So most of their training is food-based um, with some few exceptions. So how would you talk about this approach um, with it having a limitation um, with certain species and how um, they appreciate rewards or is it not applicable at all? That's a really good question. Um, I've actually had these types of conversations and I will say that for my outside, a SeaWorld, the work that I do additional to SeaWorld as being a registered behavior technician, that I am not yet board certified behavior analyst. Right? I'm looking to sit for those boards, but right now I'm just a reg registered behavior technician. Um, what I can tell you about the science is that the science generalizes across all species. Now, when I've had these type of conversations with aquarists that are specifically doing some type of shark interaction program, one of the things that's, that really hits home to me, and I think that it'd be great to be able to talk to a behavior analyst to see if this is on the same lines that they believe as well, is to once again focus on the function of their behavior. So if their function of behavior is maybe not to so much interact with humans, but you wanna do an interaction program because there's a benefit in people being able to be close to that animal. Because when they're close to that animal like that, uh, they're able to touch them, they have more of a connection, they start to care more. Well, then I would say that I would add that escape function as the reinforcer. So you allow the touches to happen and then you let them go swim off. And if you have another shark that you can start doing that and over time kind of build up that threshold where they're able to kind of stay there and stay in more interactions because you're able to reinforce them with, with what is truly valuable to them. So that's off the cuff what I would say for those type of things. But I would definitely say that behavior analysis, it applies across all species regardless. It's just us finding the ways to efficiently communicate to that species. That's great, great question. Great question. Um, Anya has a pretty interesting question. Anya, you're unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question, friend. 
Uh, all right. Hi, Megan. First off, it's so good to see you again. And um, I think you pretty much w were talking about it in the beginning. And I, and I, well, <laughs> well, I actually found it interesting that because most of the things that you said was things that I look at when I'm volunteering with large dogs at my animal shelter. And what I wanted to ask is, because usually for me, I'm working with like new animals I never interacted with. And what I, what I want to ask is that when you're interacting with like new animals, do you um, usually like experiment with different, different ways to interact with them in order to like figure out their likes and dislikes? A hundred percent. Yeah. So I would say that uh, my approach and our approach here at Zero is, is pretty conservative when you're interacting with a new animal. So we take things step by step. And that can seem for maybe some facilities or other people that we're really drawing it out, but that's critical to us. It's very important that we do everything in a very safe, methodical manner, um, that we just don't kind of throw a bunch of variables at an animal at one time. So when I'm getting to know, let's say that I was getting to know, Maddie's a prime example. Um, me just going in there and sitting with her is enough of a change than trying, if seeing if she likes this kind of toy or if she likes this paper or what kind of stimulation she really enjoys. Those type of, um, those learning experiences, I would say, that happens with time and as you build rapport. And one of the things you don't want to get into, you definitely don't want to get caught in a situation that you think that you're giving all the stuff to this animal and it might not be reinforcing at all to that animal. So typically doing the stepwise, you know, taking it one step at a time, even though it's nice and slow, it is a conservative way to make sure that you're truly understanding what's going on with that animal's behavior uh, before deciding that, hey, that was actually a change that they liked. One of the cool things that I would tell you to go look into is preference assessment. I know that there are a couple of preference assessments that are out there that have been done with a bunch of different animals. I know that um, one of my friends and colleagues is actually working on preference assessments with a sea turtles, believe it or not. So that's really cool. And I think the more kind of things that our community, regardless if you're at a zoo or aquarium, you're equestrian, you're um, with agriculture, wherever you're at, even just domestic animals, being able to look at some published ABA um, studies and journals and seeing how they're interacting, how they're determining what is reinforcing to this child is going to help you to be able, better be able to say, how can I do that with the animals that I take care for? Great question. Absolutely. And we just have a few more questions before um, we let you go. Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So Laura, you are unmuted, Laura. Go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Megan. I just wanted to ask, um, when you were operationally defining attention, what criteria did you use to define that behavior? Said by a, a teacher that works in special education. I love it, Laura. Thank you so much for asking the question. Um, so what we were looking at to define the criteria of detention was two different parts. So we wanted to look at topography based, right? But then you have the question of even if the topography is there, are they actually still paying attention? So that's why we added in the response component of our operational definition. So once again, that rostrum uh, needed to be above the waterline. So the tip of their body had to be above the waterline. It didn't have to be real close to the trainers. It could be a further out. You know, we weren't gonna hold them uh, to any other criteria aside from the rostrum out with the eye patches pointing in the direction of the trainer. But most importantly, they had to respond within two seconds. Um, if they didn't respond within two seconds and they didn't have the topography, we went ahead and said they weren't attending. Now, I will tell you that this is also, we took a very conservative approach like this because there were times that we had to mark them as non-attending, even though they still responded um, to a behavior. So they might have had their head parallel to the waterline, which isn't the topography, and the trainer still gave that SD or that signal, and the whale responded. But to make sure that we were super conservative of how we were looking at this and just research in general, we took that more conservative approach uh, to make sure that we were able to operationally define attending for what we were seeing. Great question, Laura. Absolutely. So um, we have a question that uh, was typed in, in the chat feature for me to read. Um, so if an animal uh, was having a deteriorating relationship with a trainer, how would you recommend going about working on that um, behavior positively? Can you just say the question one more time for me? Um, so a trainer had asked if a, a, a relationship between a trainer and an animal was possibly deteriorating, how would you be able to use positive behavior analysis 
to um, work on that relationship that would be deteriorating? Yeah, that's a really good question. So what we would look at there is that you kind of checks and balances, right? So when we step up, you want to try to have as many positive interactions as possible, right? You don't even really want to dip into that negative bank account at all. Um, one of the things, and I, this is probably some of the best advice I got when I was um, younger and kind of developing in the field, was that I always wanted to work the really hard stuff, right? That's something I think about as a young trainer, and possibly even a behavior analyst can kind of understand what I'm talking about here, is that you want to be able to to reach that, to achieve that thing of being able to say that I was able to work with this animal and get them to move beyond whatever the issue might be, right? One of the trainers that was coaching me at the time said, that's not your battle though, because you're still developing your relationship. So in that time that you're developing a relationship, you want everything to be as positive as possible. And you leave that, maybe those harder questions for more senior trainers that have that longer history, that longer experience specifically with that animal. They have the ability and the bank account, if you, if you think about it like that, as everything's positive, right? Positive and negative, so we wanna keep on the positive side. They have the bank account though, to be able to ask some more challenging questions. So if that were to be happening, that you felt that maybe your relationship was kind of dipping in a direction you wouldn't wanna go, I would just stop for a second, take a step away. You know, give, your second to give yourself this chance to think through why do I think that this is happening? What is the behavior? What am I seeing? And then go ahead and take those steps back just like you would on a behavior. If you're trying to use a successful approximation to shape a behavior, do that again with your relationship. Start with pairing yourself with something that's super reinforcing for that animal and build up from there. So that would be my advice for that question. Great it's advice. Great question. We have a interesting question from Joseph. Uh, Joseph, you're on mute. Go ahead and ask your question. So my question is, while you guys are closed, are you guys still doing portions of Orca Encounter or are you guys doing little helper sessions? Yeah, so our days, for everyone that's listening in, helpers is a way that we kind of break up our different types of sessions. So um, we have husbandry, HD, exercise, L is learn, P is play, R is relationship, and S was for show, presentation. Um, and so that helpers is kind of how we, it's an acronym for us here at SeaWorld, other zoos might use it, to kind of keep, make sure that we're having balance throughout the animals' lives here. Um, so we use that acronym and all those different sessions throughout the day, regardless of what is happening. Um, you know, this is a very strange time, I think that we can all say that, and um, that does not change the animals' day-to-day -day lives at all. In fact, we, we don't want that change to happen. Um, so we make sure that we are doing the same things every single day that we're still interacting with them. And yes, you're absolutely right that part of that, we do do parts of orc encounters still because that is part of their day to day. And the shows, we've even shown that, that um, we've seen that, that the presentations are so reinforcing to them. That's a great time that we can build on behaviors. They get reinforced in a variety of ways during those type of presentations and interactions. It's a great form of exercise for them. So we say as absolutely normal as it was before all of this started. Great question. Awesome answer. Uh, so we have, I think, like two more questions, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, Sophia, you are unmuted. You can uh, talk. Hi, cousin Megan. Um, I just want to ask, um, what do you use for the whistle and how for and how do they hear it? Oh, Sophia, it's so good to hear your little voice. It's a really good question, sweetie. Um, so our whistle, we call this a bridge. And so what it is, you might even see, ah, Morgan's going to show us right now. So she's going to blow this. All right. So she's interacting with uh, Malia. And if you heard... She's gonna blow her whistle. Did you hear that, Sophia? Maybe not. Well, there you go, there it is. So that whistle tells the killer whale, good job, what you just did was exactly what I was looking for. Now I'm gonna give you different types of reinforcement. So that reinforcement, it could be a fish, right? Part of their daily diet is always put into these type of interactions. It could also be a rub down like this, Kelly's playing with Milani. Um, and just putting that disc all over her. You know, it could be that they're gonna play a toy retrieval, kind of like you saw with the boys. Or it could just be what, if you look over here, that Laura's interacting with um, 
Katina, our matriarch, and she's just literally just rubbing her down. And so just like we showed with the rest of the, with the boys before, this is a great way for us to communicate to the whales. And they have little ears on the sides of their head, their little pinholes, so they can hear this frequency. And that's when they know, hey, I just did exactly what I was supposed to do. Kind of like saying, good job. Good question, Sophia. That's an awesome question. Uh, okay, we have two more questions and then we'll let you go and uh, you can close it out with any final thoughts. Um, Alexis, you are unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question, friend. Hey, Megan, I missed you. I can't wait to return to the park. Um, so my question was, what was that light bulb moment that you had that made you want to take what you were researching to SeaWorld? Um, that's a good question. I, I would say it was kind of just understanding, I would say, this gap in knowledge. And um, there's a paper uh, that was done in 2011 by Edwards and Poling. And what they talk about is they talk about the number or the lack of number of publications of um, applied animal behavior in, in the journal, specifically the Journal of uh, Applied Behavior and that. And so what they saw was that when the journal started, it was in 1968. And from 1968 to 2000, there were zero publications that talked about animal behavior using the same principles that we use every single day um, in, in that scientific journal. And that to me as an animal professional was something that I was like, we can do something with this. And we can now talk about how we use this science day after day. And it's the same science that we use with people, interacting with people. It's what we do. It's how we behave. And so when I thought about that, and then I saw from 2001 to 2011, that there are only six publications, that there is this gap of knowledge that if we combine together with behavior analyst professionals and we take those established uh, treatments and we use them just like we're using now, but we keep a little bit more of a scientific practitioner approach, we're able to kind of show scientifically what we're doing and how we interact with these animals every single day. And that kind of became the driving force. I would definitely say that that was my aha moment was reading that article, Edwards and Pulling in 2011. Um, and that, that, was, that was it. So great question. Thank you. Awesome question. Okay. And our final question, we'll let Lydia ask our final question because she's been waiting so patiently. Uh, Lydia, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Megan. Where do you see SeaWorld in five years with using the ABA strategies with the whales? Well, to be really clear, Lydia, I love your question. Thank you so much. We've been using them. We just haven't necessarily, I would say, known that we are using them, right? So we're continuing to use the science. This is when we talk about positive reinforcement, when you talk about you're a trainer and you learn how to um, interact with any of our animals, regardless if it's a killer whale, down to our penguins, our otters, our sea lions, all of those animals, we know that we're looking at three things. You have the antecedent, that first thing that happens before the behavior. Then you have that behavior, and then you have the consequence, right? And that consequence is what follows the behavior. And so we focus on positive reinforcement, right? Drawing attention to the things that we really like to see and that we want to see that behavior increase, especially when we're talking about husbandry and welfare and things like that. So I would say that we're going to continue to do this model. And that's a really exciting thing, is that this is just another way to kind of show the care, the welfare, and to really tie in and have that science be able to help us and us to learn from the science. And maybe the science even eventually learn a little bit from what we've been doing um, over the past 50 years. So that's our kind of hope and our goal with all of this. And I'm really excited that you guys all paid attention and kind of came in to listen about it. This was an awesome presentation and great questions, everybody. Uh, Megan, do you have any final thoughts before we let you go? I just want to say thank you again. You know, it's because of people like all of you that are listening in and wanting to care. It sounds like I have, we have a lot of zoological professionals on here. I know that there are a couple of behavior analysts out there. Um, and this science is something that's so important, not only for what we do here at SeaWorld and Bush Gardens and Discovery Cove, but for how we just interact with people on an everyday basis. And I think that once we wrap our heads around that, that it's not specific. When you have a killer whale, it makes it that untangible thing. You know, how do you get close to a killer whale? You don't understand that unless you've done it. But you do understand how to build a relationship with a person. And when you learn that that same experience, that same science of how you build relationships with your friends is no different than the science of how we are able to build relationships and rapport with these animals, it makes it a lot easier to understand and digest. 
And this is a critical part of their animal welfare and why we're able to provide them top animal welfare. So I would leave you guys with that. If you're interested, please go look up different uh, techniques with ABA. There's a lot of resources out there that you're going to read about and find. And it's just, it's an amazing science that we can use in our day-to-day -day lives. So thank you everyone for checking in.